and we have to actually move into the open source and the open sharing of the information and the knowledge, and that's the theme of my talk today. And if you look at another chart, this is a little bit smaller. This is actually epidermal uh, growth factor cell, which actually is seriously related with the breast cancer and other types of cancer. It's essential that you need to understand you know, how this interaction network works and, and how uh, there are a little missing interactions that we have to actually find out something. Uh, new interaction, really to uh, actually understand and prevent uh, and cure the cancer. Okay. So, but at the, at the same time, uh, it's, very, it's very complex uh, network. It seems to have some design principle behind. If you look at uh, this carefully, actually, we actually uh, digest uh, those diagrams in a specific way. We kind of uh, found out there are common theme or motif of the network that actually we call the uh, bow tie network. It resembles this bow tie structure of the network that actually has the typical characteristic of having a, a diverse input converging into a preserved core network and actually diverge out to uh, various functions so they can actually react depends on the, uh, uh, exhibit the various reaction depends on the stimuli or conditions. So this uh, bow tie structure seems to be ubiquitous fundamental underlying uh, motif of the network structure of the biological system. If you look at this uh, human metabolic network, and actually if you, uh, this is a study by Edinburgh group, I guess, uh, has a uh, uh, diverse uh, input uh, to taking a nutrient content and processing it. And it's a central TCA cycle, central metabolic cycle, and it creating amino acid and other essential ingredients uh, uh, to constitute cell and keep it going. And uh, that actually uh, has a similar structure, like uh, a big fanging and a central gigantic uh, supercluster, and then a diverse output. So it's a really consistent uh, you know, structure that we actually see. At the same time, if you look at the uh, Wikipedia link structure, this is very famous uh, in this community, I guess, had the same bow tie structure, had like a diverse input and a gigantic central core and a diverse output. So uh, we can actually uh, witnessing here is if that is if uh, any open or I, I wouldn't say any at this point, but uh, uh, typical evolvable open network seems to have this underlying design principle underlying uh, structure, which I think is uh, very uh, interesting. And uh, going back to the previous figure from this EGF receptor, if you look at this, this is so awfully complicated. If you uh, reorganize the uh, basic information flow, what you can see is there is the uh, uh, bow tie structure of the diverse input of the stimuli and uh, reacting at the receptor, and then uh, intermediate by very small number, three or four molecules, and actually going down to the diverse genes that will be activated. So uh, this, uh, again, you see the uh, bow tie structure, and if you look at this uh, very complex immune system, and if you reorganize based on the flow of information, you see diverse input converge into a very small number. Actually, there's a single molecule do that and uh, found out to the diverse output. So what is essential here is we understand the uh, mechanism of this network. I understand the mechanism in totality. And that, that's a formidable challenge. No single agent, no institution won't be able to do that. Now, what does this uh, it means actually with a practical constellation, for example, medical practice and drug discovery? If you look at this figure, also the subtitle is Japanese, but uh, you know, this is English, uh, taken from this uh, Price Waterhouse study and also the FDA data. Uh, is the uh, drug company in uh, you know, global actually spent three times more R&D expense uh, over a decade, and the result is a diminishing return. They actually had less new possible drug candidate than 10 years ago. Okay, this is striking because uh, output is reversely correlated with the amount of investment they made, and this is part of the problem is because uh, they have a little bit uh, uh, kind of uh, reductionistic view of finding a gene that then try to target that to cure the disease, and things are not that yet easy. So what we actually have to have is a paradigm shift of uh, how you design the drug rather than to find the uh, genes or protein. And you uh, need to understand how network functions. And if you move into network, things will be awfully complicated. There are, uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, some uh, very uh, future-looking uh, startup company, for example. This is the uh, company uh, uh, one of my uh, friends started uh, years ago. Uh, is company Tricks within Boston. Is they come up with a very interesting idea of uh, combining uh, 1,200 genetic drug, which is patent expires, and then uh, try, uh, try the uh, two combinations. Okay, so one drug and another drug, and combine them together. See, they find something interesting, unexpected. 
And with that, uh, very brute force combinations being they find out uh, uh, quite a number of interesting combinations that uh, come up with unexpected results. One of the uh, combinations which I find is very intriguing is, for example, this is the compromising and pentamaging uh, combination. Compromising is antipsychotic. Uh, drug has nothing to do with cancer, and pentamaging is the antiprosal. This is antibiotics, and also not to do with the cancer. And therefore, uh, if you use them uh, one by one, but this, this is actually uh, dates uh, after the injection drug, and this is the size of a tumor. And this is a blue line. It's compromising. This is antipsychotic alone, and this is uh, a green. And this is blue line in the pentamaging antibiotics alone. We're not able to inhibit the cancer, and this is a blue line. Uh, a uh, black line here is if you if you are not going to do anything in how uh, fast the tumor cells grow, and so like uh, uh, neither uh, drug alone will not have any impact on the cancer growth. But actually, surprisingly, in combination, they have very strong anti uh, anti tumoric effects. So the cancer uh, cell are strongly suppressed, and it's a black one is the Taxol, Paclitaxel, which is standard uh, anti cancer drug. And actually, in a specific case, uh, that this combination of uh, you know, seemingly undated drug, uh, you know, nothing to do with the tumor. Uh, combined together, has a very specific and strong effect on tumor uh, tumor suppression. And this is a striking and a very interesting type of. So what happened is that what they actually did in two combinations, but uh, it became uh, very clear uh, for those companies and in uh, research interests in this area. Uh, instead of having two, if you increase the number of combinations, three and four and five, we may be able to have much better and much more interesting drug combinations. That the question is, you know, how can you identify such combinations because it's combinatorial explosion. So you can actually run them screening with that knowledge. So that it is essential that actually we understand the mechanism behind it so we can actually rationally design, rationally choose the, the what compound, uh, you know, what dosage to give you the optimal uh, combinations. And this give you uh, give us a very different uh, view of how you design the drug. Current drug actually is a single molecular target or uh, have the one compound do things, okay? So actually, I tend to uh, actually target a molecule that is relatively more important. If you look at the, uh, this uh, distribution of the importance of molecule or numbers of interaction each molecule have, some molecules have very large interactions, many molecules have less interactions. The current drug tend to actually target um, a molecule with a relatively large number of interactions. At the same time, particularly two more anti-cancer drugs. And the side, uh, the, you know, drawback is they tend to have a side effect, okay, because it's important. So instead of doing that, actually, it, what happens if we actually target relatively this important drug in large number and try to synthesize, come up with a synthetic effect? We may be able to avoid targeting a very important molecule that has a fundamental importance in normal physiological function of the normal cell so that we can actually avoid uh, you know, the side effects. So this is still the sci-fi kind of idea, but I think this will be the future of the drug. But if that is actually the case, uh, we need a very different view of uh, you know, working on this issue. But actually, if you notice that the Chinese, traditional Chinese medicine, you know, some of the common Chinese medicine recipe, or many of them actually, has a very large number of active ingredients, active compounds. Uh, in this uh, example, uh, National Institute of Health in the United States actually identified the, uh, over 2,000 to 3,000 active compounds uh, involved in a single recipe. Okay. The some of the Chinese tradition, Chinese medicine actually has a single component that is very important, but in many of them, none of the compound by itself is important. It's uh, only the matter of the combination that is important to something uh, good for us. So uh, what happens if we actually use the modern idea of network science, genomics, and the molecular biology, and uh, re-engineer uh, this sort of uh, Chinese or Oriental medicine, like Ayurveda have a similar idea, and uh, China has a similar idea, Japan has a similar idea before. And, and uh, you know, I would suggest that we can uh, repeat the same thing with the Chinese medicine in the Indian Ayurveda. We actually uh, get some idea, maybe, but uh, you know, completely modernize the process. Now, at the same time, that actually can mean something completely different from the pharma industry because the pharma industry die on the paradigm. They actually find one compound that is very effective. It's not necessarily one, but a small number of compounds that is very effective, and they patent it, and then they make a drug, and then they get the revenue uh, stream. And that's the model. But if you actually have to use the thousands of compounds, or well, it's not necessarily thousands, five or ten, chances that they can patent all of them is very slim. So the inevitable, they actually move into the new paradigm, which I'll call the open pharma. 
Okay, so assume what I have been talking about so far in the last 10 minutes is a kind of future, and then I, I'm, uh, I, I'm right about this. You know, although uh, many of the farmers resist this idea of the open farmer because that forces them to change their business model completely. But uh, assume the combination of uh, the generic compounds generate a highly effective drug, which are partly uh, indicated by some of the startups and uh, some of the lab, uh, university lab as well. And if you can actually have the equivalent efficacy by the partial replacement compounds. If you have like a, some company having a patent drug, if you come up with the combination of the cheap drug and do equally well, but less effective, but do something, and then actually uh, you know use those combinations instead of buying this patented drug, which is usually very expensive. And so it's, the issue here is validizing the combination, not the compound itself. So the combination is the key, and that means. We need to have like an open source pharma, a pharmaceutical industry, rather than like having uh, you know uh, proprietary uh, uh, based uh, uh, small number of compounds because it's not possible for them to patent uh, all the compound that's likely to be involved. And uh, th so that that is uh, actually a new way uh, uh, of thinking, and uh, probably the rule game will change because rather than uh, trying to patent the compounds, now also even if you can patent the value of patent can be diminished because if you find some other combination for the cheap drug will do equally well. And uh, it is a dramatic shift for the uh, pharma industry if they buy this argument. It's uh, from the, uh, in the current model, they actually move to the service industry because they actually have to provide the service of identifying the uh, you know, patient genetic background, disease background, outbreak risk, disease uh, uh, mechanism understanding, and provide the proper combination to the specific patient or specific patient subpopulations. So they actually they can provide it, they can diagnose it, and they can follow up. So it's a big transition to the uh, you know marketing of the product to the service industry. And actually, this is something already happened in IT industry. If you look at the uh, what the Gartner did in IBM from the mainframe, which is like a traditional you know a pharma industry kind of model, to the uh, su uh, you know, service integrator. And actually, that happens in IT industry, and probably the same thing happened in the pharma and medical industry. Uh, then. Yeah, there's a completely different uh, infrastructure that may be needed. So like one of the projects like this, uh, this is outside of Sony. This is, Sony is not involved in this project, but uh, I'm sort of involved in this new university government trying to build up in Okinawa. So Okinawa is the science and technology, and this is about Institute in Tokyo, uh, the uh, project uh, in collaboration. So it's mainly by Okinawa, by the way. It's a project called the PIAO. It's a web 2.0 community tagging system. Okay, so the PIAO actually is a local fishing device in the Okinawa Philippine area that actually have, have a little bit of network actually uh, floating on a buoy. And then what happens is that there's a plankton coming in and the small fish is coming in. And because it's from small fish, a medium sized fish coming in and try to bite it. And then because the medium sized fish, they get a big fish coming in and they get a huge aggregation of fish. So that the fish are actually just take it. So it's a very efficient fish aggregation device actually. So the, uh, it's, uh, you know, the, you know, so the uh, United Nations tried to uh, restrict that because so effective. So what I try to do is I'm not interested in the fish. I, I, I like, you know, I'm, I like to eat fish. You know, last night I had a very good dinner uh, over here. But, uh, you know, uh, that's not the point here. Like I love to aggregate the knowledge. So if you have like a network of the community-based tagging, probably the students are kind of interested, and the postdoc got interested. Some young researchers who are interested in this may be interested, and the big guys in the community may be interested. So we aggregate knowledge and we get them all, and that, that's the basic idea behind it. So how we actually build up the things, we have to for the community network, and we have like an owner of the uh, uh, network, and somebody to create a baseline network, and the seed network, and the cache it, and then enable the user to actually tag. Okay, so this network is right, network is wrong, and then we have a paper on this, I have a new discovery, I and mean, we should probably add a new link, and things like that. So have the model owners, the login users, and then the visitors, and there's you know, some uh, user hierarchy there. Uh, a little bit of management structure I need to be imposed to uh, create that database, but they have the uh, structure, a uh, network, and then uh, to be targeted, a network to be evolved based on the community feedback, and uh, I'm very convinced this is the only way we can actually reasonably uh, create an entire network structure of the uh, biological system because it's not possible about one person or one project alone. So like if you look at the detail, we have like a part of the network. We actually, this is the part of the network I show uh, uh, asset of my talk. And then, uh, then uh, people can actually tag and uh, you know, what are the uh, actually 
what are the uh, evidence to actually put this interaction, for example, what are the papers, what the experiment evidence, who's arguing uh, for this, who's arguing against this interaction, things like that, everything you can tag, and you can actually comment on that, you can uh, add the comments on the comments, uh, things like that, you can create a stream. So if you look at the view the tag, and you can actually add the comments on tag, and you know, go on. So that is the uh, uh, basic uh, structure, and also uh, you can actually uh, tag to the uh, literature. So you can actually uh, click there and you can go to PubMed, you can go to the Nature or whatever the, uh, web page, so you can download the paper right away. So this is the, the basically the way of self-evolving uh, knowledge base uh, based on the network. So the uh, issue is network is interface. Okay, so that network is a gateway to the knowledge and then uh, that actually navigates you uh, what, what we're going to uh, uh, see. And then uh, uh, we're actually building it with the University of Manchester with an automatic uh, tagging system uh, based on the digital service so that like, every morning you can, but if you're a biological researcher, every morning you, uh, you know, came in office, you pop up this uh, software, you see the tags from the paper published in just 24 hours. So, okay, I'm working on this field and then you know, it's published overnight, so I gotta have to read this so, you know, before I start anything this morning. For example, so like uh, this is a news alert system on the academia based on the network. So that is the kind of architecture we're building. Okay, so assume, okay, th those stories are right, and we are start aggregating uh, information. We'll be able to take advantage of possible combinations. So it's still a very difficult challenge, even if you understand the network, even if you understand some basic idea, and then how you actually identify the proper combination against the disease. That's still a challenge, but scientific challenge. I'm not going to go uh, too much in detail. Uh, but assume those things go to what that the future. So the future, uh, what I envision is there's a merger of the healthcare and the wellness, uh, wellness system. So that, uh, what I call the healthcare and the wellness concept. Because the interesting thing going on in Silicon Valley, in particular in the United States, uh, is there's a company called like a 23andMe and another company which had a personal genomic diagnosis. So if you actually say 700 bucks and get a tissue sample, they will actually sequence that and tell you, okay, you have a risk of the disease outbreak, a breast cancer risk 40% and whatever the risk 40%, and then you have uh, you know, uh, some uh, recipe, uh, what kind of care you should take. And uh, uh, sometimes you have to probably uh, take some preventive medicine or prevent exercise, but preventive medicine is difficult because you can't get a strong drug because this is not yet outbreak, so you don't have side effects. Okay, so what you have to do is a kind of weakly interacting drug and probably multiple combination. Uh, there are some reasons why it has to be done that way, but I'm not going into detail. And then you actually take it like a daily basis, for example. And then sometimes you have like all the skin cancer risk. Then what happens is that the female can have a, a little bit of combination ingredient in our cosmetic material, so you can actually reduce the risk, for example. So it's a little bit uh, sci-fi kind of idea, but if you actually uh, merge the data, it's personalized and preventive and participatory uh, medicine. That actually not really uh, just like a healthcare issue, but also the wellness issue because you can actually prevent and uh, uh, reduce the rate of aging or uh, you know or the disease, reduce the disease outbreak risk. And then that can be all done if you successfully manage to understand what's going on, uh, you know, understand network and understand how the network interact and uh, things like that. So uh, in summary, uh, what is important here is where network is complex, but so design principle, and that, that implies there's a long tail uh, need to be pursued. The open pharma is the way, and we need the infrastructure to support everything I said. So that's very important, the knowledge to be shared and open, and therefore this is a creative commons, uh, and those uh, initiatives uh, merged with this kind of open pharma idea uh, is, I believe, in the future of the medicine in the world. Thank you very much.